Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's just past 1pm, so we will begin a showcase as more of our guests are joining us online. I'd firstly like to let everyone know that we are recording the showcase and we do intend to share the link to those who would like to receive it as soon as it's available on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. And I'll give you those details a bit later on. Welcome to our guests from across Australia and around the globe. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters that we all meet across here today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and future and respectfully appreciate that the lands and waters of Australia have always been and remain the custodial lands and waters of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which I stand today, the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples. It is upon their ancestral lands that Geoscience Australia is located. As we share our own knowledge, learning and research practices within Geoscience Australia, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and traditions of the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples. My name is Alicia. I'm the Assistant Director of Program Delivery for the Digital Earth Australia program here at Geoscience Australia, and I'll be your moderator for today's showcase. For those of you who joined us at our previous showcase, it's wonderful to have you here with us again today. And it's great to see some familiar names on the screen, if not be able to see all your familiar faces. For those of you joining us for the first time, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our third Digital Earth Australia showcase and only our second online public showcase of 2020. Despite not being able to welcome you to the Geoscience Australia building, it is wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to share our program updates with a much wider audience than we've ever been able to before. So first, some housekeeping. Because we have so many people joining us online today, we ask that you please turn your videos off, all except our speakers, of course. Um, as much as I love to see all your faces, we do have over 250 registrations, so we want to try and limit the pressure on Zoom where we can. Also, because we have such a great turnout, we will be muting all participants so as not to interrupt the presenters. So I ask you to please ensure that your microphone remains muted during the showcase. However, we do want this to be a chance for everyone to engage with us and to ask questions following the presentations, which is why we will be taking questions via the Zoom chat window only. In case you don't know how to access the chat, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little icon that looks like a speech bubble. Click on that to open up the chat and you can type your questions in there during the presentations. At the end of the presentations, I will read out as many questions as we have time for, for the presenters to answer. Some questions might also be answered via the chat window, so keep an eye out for those and please note that your questions and your comments are visible to everyone here today. Next slide, please. So that's it for housekeeping. Let's move on to our formal proceedings. For this showcase, we have four speakers and I'm very happy to say that three of them are actually from outside the DEA program and are our colleagues and collaborators from across government and industry. You can see from the agenda that we're going to hear from some, from some wonderful speakers who are going to talk to us about the work we're undertaking with Australian government to help manage water take compliance and with Australian industry to understand how earth observation can help inform and grow our agriculture sector. Before we head into our first presentation and for anyone joining us for the very first time, I wanted to briefly recap a couple of points that we've covered in previous showcases about what DEA is and what we aim to do here. If this is your first uh, showcase and you want to hear more about the program, I encourage you to head over to the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. The link is up on the screen and look for the Digital Earth Australia playlist. And that's where you'll find the recordings of all our public showcases, including the most recent showcase from May this year. Next slide, please. So what is Digital Earth Australia or DEA? DEA is the Australian government program that uses the data and images recorded by satellites orbiting our planet to detect the physical changes across Australia. We take an enormous volume of data from those satellites, over 30 years and counting. We prepare it, we remove things like the cloud cover and atmospheric conditions that make it hard to use, and we make it freely available to the public, to governments and to industry for easy use. We also take that data and develop a range of satellite imagery products that can be used for, for specific purposes. One of which you're going to hear about very soon, which is our DEA Water Bodies product. Next slide, please. 
So Digital Earth Australia was established with two main aims, and they are to firstly transform the way in which government makes evidence-based decisions and takes actions through the increased use of these Earth observation data to support their roles, support their responsibilities, and support their practices. We're going to hear an example of this very soon. Secondly, um, it is to drive the uptake of this data within Australian industry to help inform and drive the productivity and innovation throughout the economy. And part of that is working closely with sectors such as agriculture to really understand their needs and communicate with them about the benefits and the potential uses of earth observation data. We're going to touch on um, our work with industry a little bit later. But earth observation data is big, it's technical, it's still relatively new to most sectors, even though we've been capturing it for more than 30 years. And I can tell you firsthand that it's difficult to understand for anyone not directly involved in or familiar with the science or technology behind it. So our role in DEA is to work with governments, to work with industry, not to tell them what to do with the data, but to understand their needs and the possibilities so that together we can unlock its potential and help them find ways to work more efficiently more effectively and more sustainably. Once we do that, we will start to, as you'll hear a little bit later on from Phil, harvest the benefits of Earth observation data for Australia. Next slide. And we're going to move on to our first presentation so we can hear how DEA is working towards this goal in collaboration with government by helping to manage our precious water resources. It's my pleasure to introduce our own Claire Krauss, an Assistant Director of Product Development at DEA, and Dr. Ivars Renfields, our Spatial Information and Modelling Specialist with the New South Wales Natural Resources Access Regulator. Firstly, welcome Claire. Thank you very much, Alicia. So I'm really excited to be able to speak with you today about one of the really um, practical case studies we have about how Digital Earth Australia is assisting government to make um, better decisions of better information. So we'll start with the, um, the problem that we were presented with. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we have uh, petabytes of satellite data and one of the things that we like to do is ask our stakeholders what they actually want to see in the data rather than provide them um, with the access to that underlying imagery which we also do but we recognize that that it can be difficult for some people um, and difficult to understand how to use the data so what we want to do is target the way that we're providing that data and so the question that we were provided with was where are water bodies across the Murray Darling Basin and how is the water in them changing over time so we set about developing a product that would answer this exact question. The DEA Water Bodies product that you can see on the screen here has mapped more than or almost 300,000 water bodies across Australia. We used a product that we already have available called Water Observations from Space. And what we did was we turned it from a picture into a series of outlines where we've actually gone through to map and outline water bodies across the country. So in the Murray-Darling Basin, we have almost 60,000 individual water bodies that we've mapped. Next slide, please. So the reason that this is exciting is because when you have a picture of Australia, um, you can look at it, but you can't necessarily click on something and go in to explore it as a whole. Each pixel is treated as completely separate to the pixel next to it. So by drawing an outline around what we've produced, it allows you to investigate a water body as a whole. So in this little schematic, I'll demonstrate what we mean. So in the top um, left corner there, you can see there's a, a red outline, which is our water body. And in that particular water body, what you can see is that in this particular point in time, that there is a full coverage of water within that particular water body. Now with that, we have those outlines, we can actually keep revisiting each of those individual water bodies to see how that changes through time. So there in 2015, you can see that maybe 40% of the surface area of that water storage is covered in water. And then in 2016, um, in our example, you can see that it's dried out. So what this allows us to do is to not only map the locations of those water bodies, but then actually track over time how the amount of water that we can see from space is changing inside of them. Next, please. So here's an example from Lake George, just outside of Canberra. Um, and in the first picture here, you can see that um, our, our time series says that approximately 100% of the surface area of that particular storage or that particular lake is covered in water. And when you pull up the satellite imagery from that particular day, you can see that they match up. We've got a, another image from slightly later on where you can see that the, um, it's uh, starting to be uh, drying out and you can see that top left-hand corner of the lake is a bit brown. So you can see that the water is actually decreasing. 
And then we have a final image from the middle of last year where this particular water body was completely dry. And again, when we go back to the satellite image, you can see that that's what we've seen on that day. So when you pull all of these insights together, you get a tool that looks like this. So we've made this publicly available. It's available at this website, maps.dea.ga.gov.au. And what you can do is for every single one of those almost 300,000 water bodies, you can go in and you can take um, a look at the time history of how the surface area of those water bodies is changing through time. So I'm going to throw to Evaz in a second, but I just wanted to fill you in on what we did at the start of this year. So this water body tool um, is available publicly for everybody to access. And so what we did for IVARS was we provided a snapshot. So rather than each individual water body, like you can see here, we went through every single one of those water bodies um, in their area of interest and programmatically worked out at the start of a period of interest and at the end of a period of interest, what was the surface area of water in that water body. And we provided that insight to IVARS um, and I'll pass to him to explain uh, what they use that for. Next slide, please. Thank you, Claire. All right. Um, thank you very much, Claire, for the introduction. So I'll continue on from uh, what Claire has outlined and uh, show to you how we're using the Water Bodies tool and its full potential uh, to assist with water compliance monitoring uh, across the Murray-Darling Basin using the January, February 2020 water protection orders uh, that were applied across a very large area. Our next slide, please. Okay, so in New South Wales, the Water Management Act Section 324 is used to temporarily restrict water take uh, for purposes such as environmental protection. Often they are enacted with relatively little advance notice uh, to ourselves and everyone else because these natural rain events, Section 324 events, can't really be forecast too far in advance. So in this particular case, we had about a week's advance notice that water was going to be protected across 300,000 odd square kilometers of the Northern Basin, uh, where there are about 50,000 licensed works that um, NRA is charged to keep an eye on. So one of the key questions we had was how can we NRA efficiently and effectively regulate water take across such a large area with so many licensed works? Now we were aware um, of the water bodies tool through um, uh, earlier collaborations with Claire. And so we approached Claire um, with a question of what can you do, can you help us uh, in the manner that she outlined if we provide you with the date of when we would like some observations and, uh, and a finishing date. So we ticked tacked a bit and we used the New South Wales topographic mapping hydro areas layer as our baseline data set. We then intersected it with Claire's um, water body polygons layer that's derived from Landsat data and uh, ended up with about two and a half thousand dams out of 3,500 man-made water bodies that occur in the Northern Basin um, for analysis. So we requested Claire to provide that wetted area or percent wet pixel data for the closest cloud-free date prior to the start of the Section 324 order, which was on the 17th of January, and for the closest cloud-free date after the end of the Section 324 order, which was in early February. And as another advancement in, um, uh, in this process, Claire and her team use Sentinel data uh, to do this analysis and not Landsat data that's um, uh, being showcased in the uh, water bodies tool, the publicly available water bodies tool. Next slide, please. So in terms of the results, I've omitted one of the most important results that's not listed here in, in these dot points. Now, we supplied Claire with our list of 2,553 dams on January 22. And then Claire commenced the analysis and returned to us on February 13, a beautiful list of um, dams with the percentage uh, water surface area changes that had occurred between uh, the closest cloud-free image to January 17 and the closest cloud-free image to February 8. So we got those results on February 13, and they included sentinel observations from February 8. 
So this was a remarkably fast turnaround, which enables NRA to then be very nimble in its further compliance assessments, further desktop checks, and then were warranted uh, field, field checks. So out of the 2,293 dams that had cloud-free data, about 250 showed uh, wet pixel increases uh, from one hectare to 120 hectares. Uh, NRA staff independently checked, verified, and recorded further observations of water body dynamics from our daily planet imagery, as well as sentinel imagery. And then we continued to shortlist um, our initial 250 dams of interest to smaller and smaller lists by bringing in more and more data from internal databases and source, sources such as Bureau of Meteorology. So this type of analysis that Claire and the Digital Earth Australia program enabled um, provides very large efficiency and effectiveness gains for uh, boots on the ground and postal compliance checking campaigns over previous approaches uh, undertaken for water compliance over large areas. Next slide, please. So we have just outlined how we can use the concepts behind the water bodies tool to simultaneously look at thousands of dams across any area and then shortlist them. Now, if we find a reason to look at any particular dam more closely, uh, we start to use the water bodies tool in a kind of a more traditional sense. So on the right hand side here, you can see uh, what you can see in, a, in the publicly available tool. We can see the timeline of percentage full on the bottom there and how it changes over time. And we can see um, dam filling and dam emptying events and uh, dam, you know, water, water surface area steady events. So if we are interested in a particular event, we'll go to this tool in the first instance and identify approximate starting dates and finishing dates uh, for the fill events, which we then further refine from planet and sentinel satellite imagery. So next slide, please. So the process we use if we're interested in something is not particularly complicated. We simply digitize the perimeter of the uh, water surface area from our higher resolution planet imagery at a scale that's appropriate to that planet imagery. And next slide, please. And we convert those surface areas to volumes using uh, dam storage volume curves, surface area to to uh, storage volume curves that have been derived from one meter LIDAR DEMs uh, that are available across much of the Murray-Darling Basin. So I think currently we have area to volume curves available for over a thousand floodplain harvesting dams. And we are working towards integrating this information into the types of uh, satellite assessments that we are undertaking to more rapidly generate volumes, volume changes within these dams, not just surface area changes, so that uh, we can bring volumes into our internal compliance risk assessment checks. Next slide, please. If we're really, really interested in particular dams, we can start to come up with minimum plausible volumes that have changed. And we use a process of falsification where we deliberately provide an underestimate that can be very clearly demonstrated as for example, uh, the outline of water surface area there clearly falls inside the visible water outline. And we can use this type of process of falsification to really nail down what we think is a plausible minimum volume of water that had to go um, into any dam that we are particularly interested in. So we do this kind of work at a very fine resolution, typically at about two and a half thousand, one to two and a half thousand digitizing scale. And that gives us confidence that our lower bound estimates for water volumes are, um, are bound by about a one pixel digitization error in this type of work. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? So I guess GA have national and MDB wide systems and tools in place um, to take water compliance questions a bit further. And as Claire has outlined, if we click on the slide, please, um, we can zoom out to look at continental or whole of Murray-Darling Basin scales of things, or um, you know, start zooming in more. And here we see a close up around the Guaida border rivers and Namoy River with those black polygons representing dams that are full in spring 
if we click on the slide again, uh, the landscape transforms and we see the irrigated crops uh, coming in as white over the summer as the, as the stored water empties. So what is really good, I think, about Digital Earth Australia is we have at our fingertips access to this massive store of information that can be very efficiently and quickly processed with the tools and uh, the people within that work within Digital Earth Australia. And they're an independent, I guess, organization. And the independence is very important because uh, Geoscience Australia has no ties to compliance and no ties to water planning across the Murray-Darling Basin or anywhere else in Australia. And so it's kind of a science-led approach to answering these difficult questions on water use, water compliance, water management across the Murray-Darling Murray Basin. So as we've seen before, the tools and analyses are scalable from the whole of MDB down to a single lot in DP, or a single feature of interest, which is very, very powerful. And um, in the future, we are looking to integrate these types of uh, water body analyses and water balance analysis across water bodies with things such as crop actual evapotranspiration with another publicly available tool such as IRISAT. So I think Digital Earth Australia has got the potential to address some really big questions around water management in Australia in the Murray-Darling Basin and hopefully lead to convergence around some of the large differences in numbers that we see between the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, published water accounts, uh, modelled estimates of river flows versus measured estimates of river flows and, um, and start to answer some of the questions around the large unaccounted differences that we see um, uh, in the water accounts across the basin. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivaz. Thank you, Claire. Claire, I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic, if you would. Thank you very much. We're getting a lot of uh, questions through the chat. So um, we might uh, start with one. Claire, if you'd like to um, fill us in on the difference between the surface area and the volume. Yeah, absolutely. So the product that I've presented today is just using um, the Landsat satellites, which is essentially a, um, a two dimensional picture from space. Um, so we aren't able to get volume just from the product that we've produced today. What we are able to do is combine other sources of information like LIDAR, like um, Eva has explained, so that we can start to derive a relationship between the surface area and the volume. So that's work that's ongoing. It's obviously work that's already going on in NRA. Um, so the product that DA Water Bodies as it stands today is just a change in surface area product, not a volume product. I could chip in a little bit there. Those types of volume estimates we do completely internally um, uh, because that's sort of a, um, a, you know, a water management type question that um, is central to NRAR and, and DPI water. So those kinds of assessments are done internally. Thank you. And um, Claire, how big do the water bodies have to be in order to be mapped? So we had to make a call on this and we've decided that um, five Landsat pixels was going to be our minimum detection limit for the DEA water bodies product. The reason that we chose that was to minimise the noise associated because um, obviously the smaller you get, the more um, water bodies you get. So it becomes an exponential curve of, of the detection. So what we did was we cut it there because then we're cutting it off at things that are, are relatively large, but still small enough to provide insights down to, you know, relatively small scales. Um, but I did want to make a note that we have an, uh, the product we built DEA water bodies off, the water observation from space product does still provide those water classifications down to the single pixel level. So there is that information available. It's just that we've chosen not to include that very small product. Um, so that those very small water bodies in this product. Thanks, Claire. If I might throw to you for another question from Trevor. Uh, he says you've mentioned how important it is that GA is independent. And can I ask how important is it that our data is also public domain? Okay, great question. Um, I think it's very important that our data is public domain because uh, then if it's, it, it, that all aids with objectivity, objectivity in analysis, transparency in analysis and repeatability of results. If people apply the same methods to the same data set, we'll end up with the same answers. And then rather than people arguing about differences 
from different methods, we can start arguing about maybe which, which approach is the better approach. So transparency, um, objectivity, uh, very important. Thank you, Evaz. Claire, probably another one for you. Do you consider the variation of elevation within a pixel? Um, actually, I might throw to Evaz for that because our work on the volume is still very early days. Um, so it's something we haven't specifically looked at yet, but Evaz, with your curves, do you consider that? Um, it's, yeah, this is potentially a very complex question. There's a few different ways. Um, that you could derive volumes um, by intersecting satellite data with LIDAR data. Uh, but what we are doing here is we have predetermined curves calculated uh, from LIDAR data where a horizontal plane effectively was put into each dam that has LIDAR data. And the surface area of that horizontal plane uh, was determined as well as the volume of water beneath that horizontal plane. And all we do is we take our satellite estimates of area and then apply it to that LIDAR derived curve. Okay, if as well I've got you another one that might be for you. Radar altimetry is beginning to work for inland water body height estimates. Would this be of interest? This would be of great interest, yes. Um, my understanding is that LIDAR, uh, sorry, radar swathes are fairly narrow and we might not get, um, well we don't have complete basin coverage. I might be wrong on that. I'm not a, light, a radar satellite expert. But yes, um, having um, radar water surface elevation data feeding into um, storage volume curves, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And we, uh, we might uh, move, move on now to our Next presentation. So Axel, can I get you to advance the slide? Thank you all. Keep, uh, keep your questions coming in through the chat window and um, our presenters and our staff here will continue to attempt to answer them as we go through. Um, so this is where our showcase takes a turn from government and introduces some of our work with industry. But before I introduce our next speaker, I wanted to just take a, a brief step back and talk about how DEA has been engaging with industry up until now. Um, so, next slide, please, Axel. Oh, have we missed one? No, that's okay. So, leave it there. Um, so, briefly, in 2018, we engaged with Frontier SI, who are the former CRC for spatial information, to undertake a DEA industry consultation project. So, the project came from the need to increase the uptake and the use of Earth observation data by the private sector in Australia. So, we worked with Frontier SI, we spoke to over 500 people across Australia to develop this DEA industry strategy, which was released in March of 2019. So you can download the industry strategy from the Frontier SI website. Phil is going to um, provide that link uh, later on during his presentation. So please head over there to download the, the strategy and take a look. The purpose of the strategy is to increase the use of earth observation data and products by identifying and lowering some of the barriers to the use of the data by Australian businesses. However, throughout this whole process, it became obvious that the barriers to the use of Earth observation data are significant, especially when you consider that the people we were talking to at the time were already relatively familiar with Earth observation, such as the spatial, spatial sector or environment related services sector. So these barriers are obviously going to be even higher for sectors that are new to earth observation, where even the awareness around the benefits and the insights you can get from the data are much, much lower. So in collaboration with Frontier Aside, DEA started a project earlier this year, which aims to address the awareness and the education gaps that we discovered in Australian industry. And we're doing this initially in the agriculture, mining, financial services and urban planning sectors. The project is also proving to be a great way that we can actively engage these sectors and increase the uptake of DEA data and products. I'm happy to say that we've just finished our consultation with the agriculture sector and we are ready to release the, port, the report to the public and firstly to everyone here with us today. So to officially do this, I'd like to welcome Phil Delaney, who is the Chief Innovation and Delivery Officer at Frontier SI, to officially release the report titled harvesting the benefits of Earth observation. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Alicia. 
Um, so for those of you who don't know us, uh, Frontier SI is a partner-based not-for-profit organisation that's focused on growing the size and impact of the spatial industry in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we sit at the nexus between government, research and industry to help bring innovative ideas through to real-world products and services, and also helping to bridge communication and collaboration gaps between organisations. Uh, next slide, please. So as Alicia mentioned, this is a high level view of the, the DEA industry strategy. Uh, it has three core elements um, that are targeted at lowering the barriers to adopt earth observation in Australia, um, underpinned by a labs program, which we ran last year. Uh, and each of the three pillars there has a range of specific activities within it and some guiding principles as well. Next slide, please. So our main activities since releasing this uh, strategy over the past couple of months have really focused on delivering on the awareness component of the strategy. So this is about creating broader awareness across Australia of what Digital Earth Australia and Earth observations more broadly can do, starting with a selected number of sectors, and in doing so bringing new industry users and customers along for the journey. The other important thing to mention, oops, sorry, back. Um, the other important thing to mention is that uh, in engaging with these new industries, we're not only creating awareness, but also delivering on some of the education components, as a lot of the project involves real world learning examples, um, identifying and publishing use cases, and looking at scenarios that allow participants to take further action and to learn more. Now through to the next slide. So what are the challenges when we address awareness um, of DEA in particular and, and Earth observation more broadly uh, is the communication of value, which really becomes an impediment to the adoption of new technology and approaches. Um, if end users can't understand and grasp the value of what Earth observations can do for them, the rest of the adoption becomes extremely difficult. And the responsibility for this communication of value doesn't lie with the users, it lies with the technology providers. However, many, certainly not all, but many are, are often unable to separate features and buzzwords from the communication of real value or the focus on real problems. And this is particularly true in EO due to the deeply scientific nature of this field. Many organizations also find it challenging to start transitioning the skills that they have from one industry to another, for example, from agriculture to environment or to financial services. Next slide. So in order to help us overcome some of these issues, we believe that communication and market understanding is the first step. Uh, as Alicia mentioned, Frontier SI was, uh, has been engaged with a range of industries in order to create openly available information to help organizations transition into new industries, as well as helping other organizations further expand their existing work. Next slide, thanks. So today we're really pleased to be releasing the Harvesting the Benefits of Earth Observation Report in partnership with Geoscience Australia. And that report is now published and live at the Frontier SI DEA site, uh, which is on screen and will remain on screen for the remainder of this presentation. Next slide. The report presents information that we believe technology providers particularly need to have before considering starting work or expanding their work within the agriculture sector. The insights within it are by no means focused just on earth observation, as the business problems that are outlined at the end of the report are written in the language of the end users and contain no technical jargon at all. The report features a broad overview of the agriculture um, market in Australia. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, it also outlines the current trends in each segment of the market and looks at the key players in the ecosystem, many of which you can see on screen here. And obviously from a map like this, this ecosystem is quite complex and helps to explain why trust, word of mouth recommendations and focus are key drivers of value for many producers with so many voices in their ear, either wanting attention or providing advice, clarity in communication of value is really critical. But who are these users that we're talking about here? Next slide, thanks. So after extensive industry engagement, led by Dr. Brendan McAdee, 
We've outlined nine significant user profiles that we feel play critical parts of the digital value chain in agriculture, most of whom will be involved in deploying technology, particularly earth observation technology across the market. And this is also where our language tools or communication tools that I talked about earlier start to show within the report. As we're providing not just uh, success measures and profile information for each of the users, but also critical examples of language, which can either help or hinder the establishment of quality of relationships with each type of user. Next slide. So while the, focus, while the focus of the report is really on the opportunities to grow relationships and business, it is also important to recognize that significant barriers exist to inhibit the growth of earth observation in the industry. Trust is at the heart of relationships, investment and decision making within this sector. And at the moment, trust in earth observation data is not substantial across the sector, certainly not widespread. And driving this, as is mentioned on screen, is a lack of, uh, clearly articulated value, as well as unsustained access to some outputs, for example, project-based solutions, coupled with a skills gap in, in many producers or in their key advisors like agronomists. Next slide, thanks. So the substantial element at the end of this report is the inclusion of 30 problem statements that users want solved in their operations written in the language of these users. The problems have been grouped into those that affect decision making today, those that are about managing risk, and those that relate to planning and managing the farming operations of the future. These problem statements are coupled with some additional context, which may help outline the business or earth observation specific opportunity related to that problem statement. Next slide. So we hope this document helps both new and existing businesses, researchers and government service providers have more meaningful and productive conversations with their users. The report's available to download for free at the Frontier SI website. And we're now working on similar reports for the mining industry, followed by financial services and urban planning and infrastructure. We'd really like you to let us know if you or someone else that you know can help us contribute to these efforts. We'd, be able, we'd really appreciate being able to talk to you or any of the contacts you have in these industries. We're always open to hearing from companies who have great stories of working with their users. As I've said, the, the communication characteristic does not represent all the organizations, and we really wanna highlight those that are doing things really well. We also hope that many of you find the information in this report and in our future reports useful to changing how you have conversations with your key users in the future. Next slide, thanks. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Brendan McAdee for leading this work, all the individuals and organizations who contributed their time, ideas, and language into this report. And I'd also like to thank GA for sponsoring and working in partnership with us to deliver it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll also post a link to the site um, where, where the report is downloaded now. Thanks, Phil. Really excited that the report is finally out there. Um, we've got a couple of questions. One from Phil Tickle. What was your sample population? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I can consult with, with Brendan. Um, I know that from an interview perspective, we talked one-on-one -on -one, um, to probably somewhere around 40 or 50 people. We ran a number of focus groups. So those were um, groups of, of maybe five to 10 individuals to talk about problems or user profiles or validate elements of this report. Uh, we ran some online uh, workshops as well as some in-person workshops. And we also engaged heavily around the Evoke Ag conference uh, in, uh, in Melbourne, as well as drawing on many of the previous experiences uh, that we've had working in this sector. So it's hard to put an exact number on it, um, but, but we talked to quite a wide range of people from across the sector. Thanks, Phil. Um, I've got one from Trent here. Uh, you mentioned DEA Labs in your presentation. What role do you think the pro that programs like DEA Labs play in unlocking the value of the data? That sounds like a Dorothy Dixon to me, um, but I wasn't prepared for it. So look, uh, DEA Labs is, is, is really good. I think um, ac accidentally when we did DEA Labs, we, we had a very open call uh, for projects. 
Um, and just by chance, the top three proposals that came through to us of the more than 30 that, that uh, ideas that were put to us were all in the, the ag tech space. Um, and, and I think that as a result, in ending up having quite a themed uh, first round of DEA labs really helped us um, engage with a lot of new people. It helped us to promote um, the data and the outcomes and the companies that were using uh, DEA and the earth observation data in a range of forums. And it allowed us to get a lot more profile for earth observation through things like federal ministerial release that probably wouldn't have been possible had we not had uh, a, nice, uh, a nice accidental theme of, of ag tech coming through in, in all the projects that, uh, that we had in there. Hopefully that answers the question. Does. Thanks, Phil. Um, we've got a good question here from Oscar, and I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, what other industries besides financial mining, urban planning and infrastructure, and ag, of course, um, what do you think we should look at? That's a good question. I think I think it's hard to um, it's 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 hard to pinpoint an area or an industry where Earth observation could not have some role. Um, I think if we'd looked, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, or, or even in a lot of the conversations that I've been having in the past year or two, a lot of people would have said that, you know, what what would a bank ever be interested in imagery for? Um, and it's really when you start to dig into the fundamental problems that they have, particularly how businesses in these areas start to make new money and how, how you start to understand the problems that they try to solve for their customers, that you start to understand, well, there's a big role for things like Earth observation in helping to simplify the customer journey by pre-filling a, a bunch of information um, about you know, properties or valuation or, or, or things like this. So I'd say that to answer that question, I'd say it, it'd be hard to find an industry where you couldn't find a, a really good application, whether that's about managing risk, whether that's about trying to understand the movements of competitors uh, or, you know, the stocks and flows of, of large assets uh, across the globe. There's so many applications that it'd be hard to, to narrow them down. We've tried to blend uh, in our focus here, um, those which are already moderately mature, like mining and, and agriculture, with those that are less mature or maybe where there's more market opportunity uh, in things like large scale infrastructure and financial services. Great, thanks, Phil. We've got a, a lot of uh, excitement here around the mining report. When can we uh, expect to see that? That's an excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, I, I would imagine we're, we're, we're in the um, we're in the early draft of that report now. It takes a while to go about filling in gaps and then getting out to validate um, with the industry. So I'd imagine a, a publish ready report like what we have with the agriculture report, um, uh, I would imagine by the end of this year at the latest. Thanks, Phil. Sorry. No I was pressure, like, Brendan. I Sorry. Like <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, so thank you, Phil. If there's no more... Uh... Oh, sorry, the, the only other thing I'd say on that is that obviously we did a lot of the consultation for, um, for the ag work before all the COVID limitations. So things have slowed down and, and engagement is certainly different under the, under the current situations. That's, that's the main variable for us right now in, in being able to uh, get these reports out quicker. Thanks, Phil. Um, there's, a, there's a great question from Safar in the uh, chat window here. Um, in your presentation, trust was a major factor, but what about cost and skills, Phil? So skills was definitely identified in there. Um, cost is an interesting one because there's a lot of value which can be derived for very little cost. Um, and the skills is probably the main gap which is stopping people from realizing the value of what they can get for free or at little cost right now um, but even with that as 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 i've said even if people have the skills um, there are also a lot of people clamoring for their attention uh, and and the way to become the provider that people choose to use is by establishing that trust and you get that with small examples by, by, by starting small and trying to demonstrate value um, for a few people and developing advocates uh, and working up through that sector. I mean, cost is 
an issue for everyone, but that's why we focus on the, on the, on the problems that we're solving. And when those problems have real business value, then the value of the solution that you're offering uh, should be also easy to see. Thanks, Phil, that's great. Um, we're going to need to move along now to our final presenter. Um, thank you again, Phil. Great, thanks, Axel. Um, so look, before we do, Phil touched on an aspect of the market research that I consider very important to the success of, of the DA program. Um, and that is that we must work to identify key organisations that can act as advocates and partners to allow us to reach into each, of each sector. So back in 2019, I was fortunate enough to attend the first Evoke Ag event in Melbourne, delivered by AgriFutures Australia. For those of you who are unfamiliar with AgriFutures, they are a research and development corporation who fund research across multiple industries, including honeybees, rice and ginger, along with overseeing emerging industries and cross-sectoral research that supports all rural industries. If you haven't heard of Evoke Ag before, I can tell you it is the agri-food tech and innovation event and platform. Um, and it aims to drive investment and adoption of technology across the whole food and fibre supply chain. While I was there, I had the good fortune to meet Pip Grant from AgriFutures. Hi, Pip. Um, and we got to talking about the event and this drive towards innovation in rural industries. Without saying too much ahead of our next speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that our relationship with AgriFutures Australia has grown beautifully since then, thanks to the amazing team they have there. Um, it is a team that is as passionate as we are about bridging the gap across sectors and fostering the kinds of collaboration that will accelerate innovation. It is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for our showcase today, John Harvey, the Managing Director of AgriFutures Australia, to talk to us about the importance of this cross-sector collaboration and some of the things they're doing to help drive it. Thank you, John, and welcome. Thanks, Alicia, and thank you so much for the um, invitation to speak today. I really appreciate it. And we really highly value our relationship um, with Geosciences Australia, and we are certainly looking forward to working with you uh, when we uh, put on Evoke Ag in 2022 over in uh, West Australia in Perth. Um, so just uh, as Alicia said, AgriFutures Australia, we're one of uh, 15 research and development corporations. A lot of you probably heard of the large ones like uh, Meat and Livestock Australia and Grains Research Development Corporation. We're, we're probably one of the smaller ones, but the research and development corporations they spend something like $800 million per annum on research and develop in Australia development in Australia. It's a partnership between farmers and the federal government, so farmers pay a levy, and that levy is matched with dollars from the federal government. Um, so, and Alicia spelled out beautifully our mandate, but the one thing that's different about AgriFutures to the other RDCs is that we also get some appropriation to deal with issues like um, um, Alicia um, mentioned that go across the whole of agriculture. and. Agritech certainly fits into that space. Um, we recently relocated from Canberra to Wagga about four years ago, and in that process, we re, um, reimagined the organisation, I suppose is the best way to, to, to put it, and refreshed it. And in doing that, we did a whole lot of consultation around Australia, and we specifically spoke to emerging leaders. And the message we got strongly from emerging leaders in the sort of age group 28 to 35 was, this amazing interest and passion in technology, uh, particularly the digital technologies, but also an amazing interest um, and passion to be in control of their destiny and to be involved in um, uh, commercial solutions to, um, to, um, to community and uh, community challenges. And it's very powerful and very strong uh, coming, coming through that group. The other observation was that um, over 70% were female. So really strong drive um, into the agri-tech space. And that prompted me to do a whole lot of work and see what was happening in agri-tech around the world. And I'd, I've been in R&D for over 25 years, largely in the traditional spaces. And I've never seen such a move globally as what we've seen uh, in the whole agri-tech space. So in the last um, six years, the value of deal flow in the agri-tech space globally has grown from $2.5 billion to just under $20 billion in 2019. Uh, and 
um, a lot of that is driven by, you know, the new things like, you know, digital ag sensors, uh, internet of things, um, synthetic biology. But I think um, uh, it's, um, it's really captured the, the imagination of, of the next gen generation coming through. When we looked at the deal flow in Australia um, in 2018, out of that, you know, $20 billion, we had $28 million worth of deal flow. Um, in one year, so we ran a Vogue in, in 2018, in one year to 2019, that deal flow had, had increased to um, $90 million. So what we've also discovered is there's a whole range of startups in Australia, you know, in a very immature ecosystem, just emerging um, and um, quite interested and um, looking for opportunities to start startups and looking for technologies they can use in those startups. And I think that's where the partnership with um, Geoscience Australia is so important because a lot of the startups, particularly the digital based startups where they're providing a service over the internet, a lot of that is based on being able to access data and particularly the publicly sourced um, data. And um, just to give you, you know, a, one example, uh, we've had a lot of interest in all of the space technologies and we're currently running a sh small workshop to try and identify what some of the key challenges are. And some of the key challenges that we've identified out of that process is, is a general lack of information on what technology and services are available um, to their industries. Um, resolution, where the spatial scale of data is just too large for management requirements. Um, the information is available, but doesn't solve a real business uh, need. And that was really, I think, overlapped with what Phil said. Um, the technology will have impact if only people had connectivity. And I just don't think people realise just how big this connectivity is, issue is in the bush and getting reliable, high speed, reliable, high volume um, connectivity is critical for, for this to be useful and for some of the digital based startups to be successful. Um, and finally, um, just understanding that return on investment. So what is, what's the value proposition? And uh, I, I won't go onto that because Phil covered it so beautifully in his um, presentation. So we're really excited about making some of this data available to the startups. That's already started with Evoke Ag and the work that Geoscience Australia did at Evoke Ag last year, and hopefully we'll continue that in 22. Um, but I, I just wanted to finish with one other comment and um, to just give you another aspect or another potential um, use of Earth observations, we recently uh, commissioned some work looking at social license and looking at how um, people in the agricultural sector can build uh, trust with the broader um, Australian community. And, we, and uh, through that work, over 6,500 people were surveyed and they looked at what is it that people in the city particularly value about farmers and agriculture. And um, I, I'd have to say my expectation was that people would say, you know, our biggest expectation and where what we value farming farmers for is their ability to grow, you know, food and fiber um, to feed us. Um, and, uh, it, and that was certainly high on the list, but even higher on the list was an expectation around farmers being fabulous and being good at protecting the environment and managing the natural resource. So managing the natural resource for the next generation was their number one um, driver of, of trust with the community. And I, I'm saying that to, the, to this audience in particular because I just think part of building that trust is providing information and providing data. And the earth observations I think could be huge, could play a huge role. In, a, in actually building that trust with the broader community about the role that farmers play and how they are managing and improving um, the environment in which they operate in. So Alicia, I'm just gonna leave it there and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks, John, that was fabulous. Do we have any questions for John coming through the, the chat at the moment? We have one here. Um, do you think there's potential for conflict in, between the unstable nature of startups with frequent pivots in business strategies and the need to develop trust and reliability in spatial information in Australia? It's, gee, that's a really good question. It ab ab absolutely there is. And, and it's, I'm not sh it's partly trust, but it's also 
um, a different way for farmers to interact with um, researchers and technology. So in the past, they would be used to, you know, interacting with the CSRO or Department of Ag or University. They would be used to lots and lots and lots of trial work and, and something proven, you know, many times over. The downside of that is that it often takes 10 or 15 years to get research out to farmers. With the startup, the relationship's much, is quite different and it needs to be a partnership, particularly with the early adopters. And there needs to be an understanding on the farmer's behalf that it may or may not work. And there may be an investment that delivers, you know, n not a lot. Um, and there needs to be an understanding that startups have to pivot if they're going to survive. So, so we actually have done quite a bit of work trying to build that understanding with people that, cut, that farmers that want it, that are interested in technology and want to partner with startups just to get their expectations real and get them realistic. Uh, what we also find though, is there's a lot of younger farmers that just love, absolutely love interacting and the excitement of interacting with a startup and being part of developing a new way of farming. So, you know, that, that, that's the balance, um, which I, which I think startups are now starting to really lock into. Thanks, John. That's fantastic. Um, I think we we are coming to the end of our showcase. Um, but one thing that uh, that's come through loud and clear during the showcase is that this uh, this conversation that we're having here together today is so important. And um, I'm seeing another another showcase on on our horizon, John. So if you're happy to come back at some point, we'd love to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our third Digital Earth Australia public showcase. We hope you enjoyed it and we thank you very much for joining us online to hear some of the examples of how DEA is working with government and industry. Um, one, one thing I want to say is that it's, it's obvious, and I'm going to say it again, is that uh, harvesting the benefits of Earth observation is not something that we can do alone and it's not something we can do in isolation. And I'd like to particularly thank our four presenters today, especially our guests, who have given their time to share this message because it's something we're all passionate about. Um, we've heard from our presenters about how we can work together, but we know we're just getting started and I'd encourage everyone here to, as I mentioned, continue this conversation amongst your own organisations, with your own stakeholders, and to please reach out to DEA and continue the conversation with us so that together we can start to realise the potential of Earth observation data. Um, the contact details for everyone are on the screen. Um, as I mentioned, this showcase has been recorded and it will shortly be available on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel via the Digital Earth Australia playlist. And that also contains the recordings of all our other showcases. So please um, head there and check it out. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to the people behind the scenes who helped make this showcase happen. Uh, especially our director, Trent Kershaw, my colleague Chris Penning and the amazing Alex Proctor who is even as we speak still ensuring that this showcase is delivered without a hitch. And to you, our audience, on behalf of Geoscience Australia, we thank you all for joining the program online here today and we look forward to once again welcoming you to our next showcase in October. Keep an eye out for that invitation in your inbox. Good day and thank you.